Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the meeting house. All across this room, I want to invite you to stand to your feet as we get ready to sing together. We celebrate the birth of the King.
nation. You may be seated. Christmas revealed, the father lay all of his cards on the table, all in, for the hope of the world to be born on the floor of a stable, cause there was no room left for him. Regardless of circumstances surrounding all who were around him, bowed their heads and crowned him. His name is Jesus, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, absolute in completeness, unchanging, forever reigning, a bright star shining a light that's never fading, framing the opening scene of this reality play, setting his stage for a tale coming of age, where a child was given all of sin and death on his plate, still he consumed it, leaving only life in his wake, and the angels shouted. Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth. The dark is over when this sun rises. It can't divide what this sun has united. The gift of the sun is life is free and indeed priceless. Jesus, his grace without bounds, his love without conditions, power in his hands to free captives from their prisons. Jesus, the true meaning of Christmas.
All right, my name is Josh Crane. I'm the senior pastor here at the Meeting House. I'm Meredith Ankos. I'm the teaching pastor here at the Meeting House. We are so excited that you've joined us here today. So the Meeting House, we are all about our Sunday services for sure, but we are also about deep relationship with one another and our circle groups, and we're about giving back and pouring into the community and the world all around us. So we're just delighted that you've joined us. Today, for our Christmas Eve service, we wanted to give you a heads up about two of the giant elements. One of the first ones is fun and celebration. We believe that this is a season worth celebrating, amen? Amen, amen. <laughs> you guys did so much better than first service with that one. It's unbelievable. I can't wait to tell them. Yes. The second element. <laughs> is Jesus. We don't want to forget that, Jesus. We are here for fun and celebration, but we're here to remember and reflect why we are gathered together, that Jesus has come, that he has come to save us, that he's come to deliver us, that he's Emmanuel, God with us. And so we wanna keep reflecting on that throughout this evening. And so we're gonna invite you to continue to worship with us as we reflect on this holy night. are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul fell Sweet hymn. 
to invite you on January 7th, 2018, coming up, to come back for our new series we have called Healthy, and we're talking about what it looks like to live a healthier life, both like in your physical health, in your relationships, and then also with your finances. And so uh, what does it look like to follow after Jesus in all of life and living healthy? January 7th, 2018, we hope you'll join us back here at 9 o'clock in the morning and 10.30 in the morning are our service times starting then. Hey, all across the meeting house, I'm going to ask for our ushers to start coming forward. We're going to receive an offering today, and just as a little bit of a heads up, if you haven't been with us for the last several months, uh, all of today's proceeds are going to go toward an initiative we have here at the Meeting House called All In. And our All In initiative, it's really what we're looking to do over the next two years as a church in order to engage the Cumberland Valley and beyond with the gospel of Jesus, in order to meet some needs in our immediate area, and in order to really get the gospel, the message of Jesus all around the world. And so we hope that you'll consider uh, being a part in your generosity toward giving toward our All In initiative. And if you don't have cash or check with you because you're like me and you don't carry those things anymore, we actually have a way that you can give online as well or through text messaging. And we've got a slide actually back here. If you want to text TMHC to 77977, you can actually continue to be a part of this moment as well, even if you didn't bring anything with you. We try to make it as easy as possible. We want to say a prayer over this and over how it will be used because we think that what we do with our money is a matter of the heart. And we want to pray that what we do with our money actually gets just exponentially multiplied by the Lord uh, to reach people all over the world with the name of Jesus. Would you pray together with us? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the gift of Christmas. And Lord, as we come together today, we recognize that, that everything we own really is yours. And so we pray that you would help us to be faithful stewards of that. And you would help us to be wise and disciplined with the way that we use our finances. And Lord, today as we approach this giving moment, that you would uh, lay on our hearts whatever it is you would have us to give today uh, to reach the people in the name of Jesus in this area in the Cumberland Valley. Thank you for the opportunity we all have to go all in for our kids and our neighbors and our world. And Lord, we just pray that you would exponentially multiply this money, uh, that many more people would have their lives changed, transformed, that many more people would receive basic needs that they have, food and clothing and shelter and all those things because of the work of this church and your congregation. And we thank you for the opportunity for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. So as those baskets are being passed around, I just want to point your attention to this packet that you received when you walked in today. Uh, this top card just tells you a little bit of information about us and what we have coming up on the back of it. The one underneath that is the one, if it's your first time here, we'd love for you to let us know a little bit more information about you. So this is our Connect card. And you can either leave this in the seat back in front of you if you don't want to talk to anybody, or if you can go to our Welcome Center right after our gathering time here, it's right outside these doors just to your right, uh, you can hand it to them. 
and they will give you a free gift just as a way of saying thank you so much for being our guest. We're really excited to have you here today with us, and we'll follow up a little bit to let you know what some of your next steps could be. We will not be invasive, and you won't get put on any kind of uh, crazy spam list, win a free iPad, or anything like that. We just would love to know who's here today. So we are very excited about uh, this Christmas season. We're excited on this Christmas Eve to be celebrating the birth of Jesus as we go into tomorrow. And at this, at this time, we'd like to spend a few moments reflecting on the hope that Christmas is. What a beautiful thing to reflect on. In Christ alone, our hope will stand. 
We'd like you to just take a moment now. We're so glad that you're all with us. And to, to stand up, say Merry Christmas to one another, say you're glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're here, and we'll be back together in just a moment. We're okay. All I want for Christmas is my two fat teeth. My two fat teeth. My two fat teeth. Gee, if I could only have my two fat teeth, then I could wish you Merry Christmas. It's the most wonderful time. Hey, everybody. We're so excited that you're here with us today. And we've got kind of a special treat as we enter into this most wonderful time of the year. For only the second time ever in our history, our Dillsburg campus, we have two campuses here in Carlisle and in Dillsburg. Our Dillsburg campus is joining us live right now. Right now. Can we welcome them? Say hello Let's to say Dillsburg. Hello, hey, Dillsburg. guys. It's great to have you with us. So we're really, really excited about we that. We are so excited. Josh. This is indeed the most wonderful time of the year. I love Christmas. I do too. It's a great time to get together with family. Sometimes we do things together, activities that we don't do the rest of the year. We bake together. We get together yeah. and do our baked goods. You know, sometimes we visit with family members we haven't seen in a while, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Yeah, we, we, uh, we light the place up by adding lights to our house. Lots and lots of lights lots to our house. Lots and lots of lights. And some yeah. people get like super creative with their lights. That's right. You know? And yeah. some people, instead of getting creative, they see what the other guy did and they just get super lazy. Like that <laughs> happens for some people too. And then there's just some people just get plain old weird with their lights. I yeah, don't, you get kind of weird. It's not a real it's deer. Not a real deer. It's not real deer. It's not real. It's just the light. Bambi's mom is still with us. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. You didn't yeah. watch the movie, huh? Yeah. And then <laughs> we, we wear things that we would never wear any other time of year, I've no. noticed. But Always you know what else on. we do is some people dress up their dogs. Like, you know, who doesn't like a dog with a Santa hat on? And them? some people get so swept away by the Christmas spirit that insanely they dress up their cats. Yeah. And that's... That goes exactly how you think it would. That is, is what never that does. a good idea. Never, <laughs> ever, ever. But it does feel kind of wondrous and magical this time of year. And, and it certainly, um, at times, can feel even surprising. Lots of surprises. Oh, you know, I see you have surprises. Um, I have a surprise for you, Josh. Oh, you have, you have a surprise for me? Yeah, I have I a surprise for you. I don't usually like your surprises. You're, I think you're going to like this one. Okay. Um, did you know that at Christmas you can elf yourself? <laughs> no. Uh, but I guess it shouldn't surprise me. Well, you can, and I did. So oh. this is for you. Surprise! Okay, I can't imagine that we need to see any more of that. <laughs> Those are real dance moves, everybody. We really do that. No, we don't. <laughs> You know, the only thing that really is upsetting about that video is that meme was such a better dancer than I am. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> it was ridiculous. It really was. You know, but so Christmas is amazing and wonderful, full of surprises. But the sad thing about it is it just, it doesn't seem to last. You know, like, it's so great. We put up lights and put up all these decorations, but when we start to take them down and we take the lights down and we put the tree away and it, it feels like the joy and the wonder that comes with the season just fades away too. And part of the reason why I think that happens is we miss the Christmas story all year long. You remember the Christmas story. You one know, with the, the one with angels and shepherds, shepherds and all and, that. Yeah.
of the Christmas story is found in Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 20. It says, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet, look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The promise of the Christmas season, of the Christmas story, is that God has drawn near, that God is not far, God is Emmanuel, God is with us, and God has come to do that in order to save us from our sins. Now, if you've been around church for a while, when you hear that save us from our sins, too often we hear that as forgive us for our sins, which is to forgive us for the bad decisions that we've made or the bad things that we've done, and that is certainly part of the message of Jesus, but it's far bigger than that. That word save doesn't mean forgive. That word save means to deliver, to rescue, to set free, to release, as if someone is a captive. See, sin is far bigger than the sum of your bad decisions. In fact, in the Bible, sin isn't a verb. Sin is a noun. Sin is a noun that causes verbs. Sin is kind of like the noun that invaded my house last week. So it might have invaded your house too. It's called the stomach bug. And the stomach bug is a noun that caused a lot of verbs in my house last week. Maybe some of you can relate, right? Sin is kind of like that. It's like talked about as this infection that we have. The Bible actually talks about us being trapped in it, being a slave to it. Paul, who's one of our earliest Christian leaders, this is how he talks about his relationship with sin, what it feels like to be stuck in it. He says, the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not the one really doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. See, sin is this noun, and we see the symptoms of it pop up in our behavior, in our decision. One of the ways that we talk about sin around here at the Meeting House, because sometimes we hear that word and we think, I don't even know what that means. It's, it can be a lack of self-control, or we often say the human propensity to mess things up. It can kind of look like this. When we start to think, you know, this Christmas I really, I want to be patient with my kids and I want to be kind and I want to have good moments with them, but instead we lose our temper and we say things that we don't mean to and we end up with hurt feelings. Or sin can sometimes look like I'm going to have self-control, I'm really going to get control of my weight and my eating or whatever habit I have and then you go to dinner and you overeat again and you wonder, why did I do that? Or it can look like you know, this year, I'm going to get my finances in, or, in order. I'm going to make sure that I'm fiscally responsible, but instead I end up racking up debt on things that I don't really need. Or it can look like this year, I'm going to start being honest, and I'm going to start telling the truth, but instead I keep lying to those who are around me and deceiving them. See, the problem is we're all slaves to sin, if you are human, then you are all too human. You're stuck in this bucket. In fact, every human you have ever met is in the same predicament. Every human, me, is a very good likeness of me, right? Looks just like me. I am trapped in this same bucket. My husband, my daughter, Josh, his wife, his kids. You have people like Mother Teresa. Well, Okay, Mother Teresa, I'm just going to put her over here for right now. She is Mother Teresa. I'm not comfortable putting her in the bucket yet. But, you know, like your favorite gym teacher, that college professor who changed your life, that author that you love, all of your favorite TV stars, all of your political heroes, your military heroes. I know a whole bunch of you want me to put the New England Patriots in there. I'm a fan. You know, some of you are cheering, but you know what? They go in there, but you know who else goes in there? The Steelers have to go in there too. And that ref, he goes in there too, you know, and uh, 
You know, that grandma that you love who bakes you cookies and still sends you $5 because she thinks that's a lot of money, but you're like, you can't really do much with $5. Grandma, she goes in there. Everyone, you, your spouse, your kids, your best friend, every human being that you have ever met or who has ever existed, it's all stuck in the same bucket. Every person is trapped. That's the image that we get, even Someone like Mother Teresa, she goes in the same bucket. We are all too human. We are all stuck. We all have the human propensity to make a mess of things or have that lack of self-control that we just can't seem to capture. Every single one of us is in need of being saved. Every single one of us needs to be rescued, to be delivered, to be released, to be set free. So this is how we enter into the Christmas season. When, when Jesus is born, this is where humanity is. This sin, we've passed it on like a virus from person to person to person. This human propensity to make a mess of things has wrought all kinds of destruction. And then Jesus, the one who Matthew tells us, won't just forgive us of our sins, Like, it's not just that we need to be forgiven or released from the consequences of our sin. Like, there are so many of us who have seen that when we have, like, that darkness in our life, there are real consequences that that come about. There are people, thousands and thousands of people in prison all over the United States that have asked forgiveness from the family that they've harmed, and they've asked forgiveness from God, and they're forgiven, but they're still going to, like, sit in a jail cell for years or maybe for the rest of their life because there are consequences to our decisions And so Jesus didn't actually come to release us from the consequences of us. He actually didn't come just to forgive us. He came to free us, to save us from the power of sin. That's what Matthew tells us. And that gives to me like a whole different kind of meaning to the Christmas story. In the book of John, in chapter number 8, there's this story where Jesus goes to the temple and he's teaching in the temple and this group of Jewish leaders bring him a woman who they have caught red-handed in an adulterous act. And their law said that if you catch someone in an adulterous act, you can actually stone this person. So they bring this woman to Jesus and they say like, our law says that she should be killed. What do you think that we should do? And they're trying to trap him. They're trying to get him to say like, either to stick to the law or don't stick to the law. And either way, they can try to harass him for trying to be this new political leader, this new religious leader that's come onto the scene. And instead of answering their question, Jesus actually stoops down and begins writing in the dust. There's been endless debate as to what it is that Jesus wrote because John doesn't tell us in his gospel. But he looks up after a time of writing and he essentially says to them, because he knows, he knows, A, they're not going to stone her here at the temple with all these people looking on. You don't stone people at the temple. And B, it's actually against Roman law, even though it's not against Jewish law, to stone this woman right here without any kind of a trial. So that's just not going to happen. So he looks at him and essentially says, if you want to stone her, go ahead and stone her. You can take her down to the Valley of Ben Hinnom where they do this kind of thing. That's where you can take her if you want to. I have one caveat, though. The one of you who is without sin is the one who has to throw the first stone. One by one, the people leave. No one casts a stone. John tells us that Jesus straightens up. He looks at the woman and he asks her, where are your accusers? She says, well, there are none. He said, then neither do I condemn you. I, Jesus, who have the power to condemn, I, Jesus, who am able to both forgive people of their sins and to charge them with them, I don't condemn you. Now, he says that, and that's actually very famous. Lots of people have heard that, even people outside of the church, people who aren't typically in a church service, they've heard that part before. But then he says something right after that 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 gets way less play. After he says, neither do I condemn you, he follows that up by saying, go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and sin no more. So sin is something that is a power. It tends to be a master that we have. And what Matthew tells us 
is that Jesus actually came to save us from the very power of sin itself. Jesus tells us in John 8 that this woman can go and leave this life of sin behind her. He tells us in John 10 that he came that we might have life to the very fullest. And that's a life that has to be more than just getting forgiveness from sin. Because a lot of times when we talk about what it is that Jesus does, we just say, oh, he forgives us. And we just have this idea like nobody's perfect, but God forgives. Nobody's perfect, but God forgives. And I think when we approach the Christmas season and that's all we see in the Christmas narrative, it's hard for us to get as amped up and as excited and for that excitement to go all year long then because we just go, yeah, he forgives. Everybody needs forgiveness. I guess that's a good thing. But what Jesus is actually telling us is far more radical than that. Jesus actually releases us from the power that sin has over our life. The book of Romans in chapter six and verse 23 tells us that the price of sin, what sin actually does for us, is kill us. It's death. That's the price of sin. And we actually kind of intuitively know that. And again, you, you may not call it sin. I know that on a day like today, there's a number of us here who probably aren't in church that often. It may not be a word that's really part of your vocabulary. You may call it, you know, your your constant mess ups or you know, the way you were raised or your lack of self-control or oh, so my parents handed it down. You may call it something different, but what Romans tells us is that the price of that stuff ultimately is death because sin kills things. Sin kills things. And we kind of intuitively know this, like sin has killed marriages, right? One person has an affair on the other or one person doesn't treat the other in a very loving or kind or good way. And then like the marriage starts to fall apart. Sin kills Marriages, lack of self-control can kill our financial lives. It can kill the amount of money that we have on hand. We can be constantly worried and stressed out because we haven't had the kind of self-control that we should have. Uh, a, a lack of like, being able to be selfless, you know, selfish behavior tends to kill the relationships all around us. All of us understand that even the things that we want to do, we don't always do. And the things we don't want to do, we still end up doing them over and over again. And that there are always consequences to that because the price of sin is death. It kills things. And what Matthew tells us and Jesus tells us and John tells us is that Jesus has come to free us from the power of sin as our master and to have a new master in Jesus. And since Meredith was so quick to throw my whole family in the sin bucket, I'm gonna throw her family in the Jesus bucket. You're welcome, Meredith. That for those of us who will choose to follow after him, he is here to free us from the power that this sin has over our life. In fact, if we choose to follow after him, everything about our life can be made new. We don't have to just get forgiven and then just keep on and living the same old, same old life. Actually, the gift of Christmas is that Jesus has come and the world is being renewed and restored and reconciled and that all of us who choose to follow after Christ actually get to join in that act of restoration and reconciliation. Now, if you already consider yourself a Christian, follower of Jesus, and you're here today, it's fantastic, but for many of us who would say that we're followers of Jesus, there's been a really consistent pattern in our life. We try, we fail, we ask for forgiveness. We try, we fail, we ask for forgiveness. We try, we fail, we ask for forgiveness. And I just want you to know that Jesus didn't just come to forgive you of your sins, but to save you from the power of them. You are like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. She's got those ruby slippers with her for almost the entire time and all she has to do is click her heels together and say there's no place like home and she has great power that she's wearing around constantly that she doesn't know to tap into and all she had to do was click. That was louder than you thought it would be, wasn't it? Yeah, good, good heel action there. That's all she had to do. And we find ourselves in the same place actually that, that Jesus says, no, I, I've got the power to, to save you from your sin. You can have a new master now. You don't have to keep living your life like that. So if you have been caught in the cycle of try and fail and ask for forgiveness and try and fail and ask for forgiveness, I just want you to know that there might come a moment in your life when you start to realize actually Jesus is my master and sin no longer is and it doesn't have power over me anymore. And so look at me all across the meeting house, like those of you who follow Jesus, can you just look at me for just a moment? I just want to say something to you. Sin is not your master. Lack of self-control is not your master. 
Low self-esteem is not your master. Anger, it's not your master. Jealousy, it's not your master. For those of you who choose to find life by following Jesus, your master is Christ and he has been able to release you from the power of sin. And if you can start to get into a place where you are waking up in the mornings and you're just praying, God, today, use my hands to do the work of your kingdom. Father, today, use my feet to take me to the places you want me to go. Lord, today, allow my mind to be captive to your thoughts that I'm always on the lookout for what it is that you have for me. If you can allow yourself to finally come to a place where you say, you know what? I will not allow the members of my body to be captive to that which is no longer my master. To say that, God, I believe that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is now working and alive inside of me. And that gives me absolute strength to live with Jesus as my master and not sin as my master. For those of you who have already chosen to follow Jesus, the gift for you this Christmas is to recognize the power that he and you through him now have over sin. Now, there are a number of you here who you're not church people. This was a real stretch for you to come today. Someone told you if you came to this, they'd give you ham and sweet potato casserole, so you showed up. Thank you. It's really good to have you here today. I'm really excited that you're here this afternoon. And for you, uh, this may all be really weird that we're talking about this. And concepts like sin, again, may feel like, like 30, like I, these are, I never think of it in terms of this. And that's totally fine. Again, like I said earlier, you may think of sin in terms of like lack of self-control or the way I was raised or oh, my mom and dad said, or, yeah, that's totally fine. I totally get it. I just want you to know that if you, ever get sick and tired of the sin in your life, if, if you ever get sick and tired of you and the destructiveness that you see that you have with your own habits and broken relationships, if you ever get tired of living like that, the gift of Christmas is that it is a standing invitation from your heavenly Father for you to follow after Jesus and start over completely. That's the gift of Christmas. And you, you also don't have to keep trying and failing and trying and failing. The gift of Christmas is that you, no matter what your background is, how messed up your life seems to be right now, or how great your life seems to be right now, you are a candidate for Christmas. So here's what I would like to do all across the meeting house here in Carlisle and Dillsburg. I'd like for all of us to just take a few moments right where we are to bow our heads and to close our eyes. Just no one looking around, just thinking to yourself, listening to the sound of my voice. I would just like for us to take a moment to do that. And here's what I'd like us to think on this morning. If you're far from God, I've got some great news for you. Uh, getting near God will be the simplest thing you've ever done in your whole life. It'll cost you everything, but it's so worth it. So all you have to do really is to surrender the control of your life over to Jesus. He makes everything new. You get a fresh start, and some of you need to do that today. Some of you have never given your life to Jesus. You don't have to join this church. You just have to surrender control of your life to him. So everyone within the sound of my voice, if that's you, if you want to do that this, this afternoon for the very first time, I'm going to pray a prayer here in just a moment, and I want to lead every one of you at every campus in it, and I would just ask right where you're seated, just in your head to pray along with me. If you want to pray out loud, that would be totally fine too. I'll, I'll say a sentence, and I'll give you a little beat, and you can say it with me. So here's the prayer, and I'd love for you to join me with it. God, thank you for sending your son to pay for what I did. I receive the forgiveness of my sins. I surrender my life completely to you. I give you my life. I want to know you, I want to serve you. Be my God, my savior, and my friend. I confess Jesus is Lord. I believe he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And I surrender my life to him. It's in Jesus' name I pray, who saves me from my sins, amen.
Amen. You can look right up here. Now listen, all across the meeting house, we've got hundreds of people here. I assure you, just like the first time we did this today, we had a number of people just choose to take that first step to find life by following Jesus for the very first time. Meeting house, can we give them a big round of applause and just welcome them in? Absolutely. I can think of no better way to start your Christmas off than by choosing to follow after the very one that Christmas is all about. Listen, I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing. I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna ask you to come forward, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing though. If you wanted to choose to follow Jesus, if you prayed that prayer with me or if you, or if you wanna pray that prayer with me later on, this is in the packet that you were given, this little white piece of paper. And this is probably the most important piece of paper that you'll hold in your hand all year. This just tells us your name, your email address, and a phone number. Here's what we wanna do. We wanna get in touch with you over the next couple of weeks, heading into the new year. We wanna send you a packet with your next steps in it. So I know a number of you came today, you're like, I don't wanna to talk to anybody. I'm just barely here. I'm getting out of here and getting ham. I get it. Like, you don't have to talk to us if you don't want to, but would you please fill this out and let us know that you made that decision so that we can send you something about what your next steps would be. We'd really love to do that for you. Uh, this, this is really, really important. So here at Carlisle, if you don't wanna talk to anybody, you can just put this in the back of a seat at our Dillsburg campus, uh, you can put this on the seat right where you are because those seats stay down. And if you, if you don't mind talking to someone, if you wouldn't mind just saying hello, they won't badger you. But we actually have uh, this out in our lobbies. This is a, a, a bag that says Race to Life. It's got a couple of books in it and, and a little note from me as to what your next steps would be. If you're okay with just saying hi to someone and handing them the card, we'll give you this today before you leave here so that you can figure out what your next steps are and finding life by following Jesus. Listen to me. We are so thrilled that you would be willing to follow after Christ, and I can't think of a better time for you to do it than today. So thank you so much for that. And as we move into this next part of our time together, I am very excited that some of you will do it for the first time as followers of Jesus. The Gospel of John says this, that, Jesus, that in Jesus was life, and that light, life was the light for all people. And the light is shown in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. See, here's the thing about light and dark. When, when there is light, you can't bring in more dark to get rid of the light. So it doesn't matter how dark your life may feel. It doesn't matter where you find yourself this evening. The light of Jesus, when that light breaks into our lives, there is no more darkness. But here's the thing, you can't bring in more darkness to get rid of light, but the more light you bring in, the less darkness there is. And this light that Jesus has brought to the world to break the darkness, he's given it to each and every one of us. And so tonight, we're gonna invite you all to stand we're going to share the light of Jesus all across the Meeting House here in Carlisle, all across our Dillsburg campus. We are going to shine the light of Jesus and remember that where there is light, there is no longer darkness. Would you please stand? And don't just share the light with that person right next to you. Share it with everyone around you.
that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus also says this to us, you are a light. You are a city on a hill. You are like a lamp and nobody lights a lamp and puts a bowl over it. You light a lamp to, to light up the whole world. And so each and every one of us here in Carlisle and in Dillsburg, I'm gonna invite you to raise your light as a witness and a sign of who we are and who we know Jesus to be in our lives, that we are called to be a light in a dark world. Let's sing all voices. sound beautiful church and uh, here's the thing you're gonna want to blow those candles out for this next part <laughs> so all across the meeting house here at Carlisle and in Dillsburg we thought we'd end our time together by blowing the roof off the joint is that okay <laughs> so candles out because there may be some helium involved in this next section <laughs> yeah now they're going out good job some of you weren't listening to me before Decided you wanted to still be alive for Christmas Day, did we? Okay, yeah, I got you. All right, here's the thing. We are entering tomorrow into a joyous time of the year because Jesus Christ was born and the world will never be the same. It's a wonderful thing. So we're going to all stay standing together as we go for this one last time and we sing joy to the world.
Christmas Day. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you back in January for our healthy series. Good night. Good night.